And as I said, then um, that's the airport before the earthquake. When the thing then happens, the disaster, um, a lot of things happen at the same time. One of the first things that, that this airport notices is that the volume of activity at the airport goes up dramatically. In this case, about three, three times. So not double, but three times the normal activity. Uh, what is going on? Um, for instance, um, in the second row there you see the airport doesn't only serve to let aid in, but a lot of people also use it to get out. Um, you know, there are lots of maybe tourists there. Uh, there's maybe um, people who just want to go to their family somewhere else. So a lot of the outgoing activity also increases mostly dramatically. Um, there are evacuation plans in place from different governments. It depends a little bit if you're a German or American or, or Belgian like me, and we were usually and last, last in the line to be evacuated. But Americans are typically very fast, so they want to get their people out. Um, so that happens. Uh, of course, for the incoming flights, um, the, as I said, the airport is not functioning 100%. It was, in this case, also damaged. Um, and, and another thing that typically happens is that the people who are operating the airport, uh, guess what? They also live there. And if you would work at an airport and your house would have collapsed and maybe some of your family members are still you know, missing, um, I don't think you would go to work that day, right? So a lot of people don't show up as well. Of course, because they have better things to do. Um, so um, the, the whole operation of the airport, the, 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 the people working there, all the supply chains. You know, you, you, you get stuff at the airport, you, uh, you get it out huh, by truck or whatever. That is also all interrupted. So you can see that all, very quickly, this whole airport becomes sort of a mess. Uh, everything is stuck there, it's not working there. The pressure is mounting, uh, people want to get out. Um, so as a consequence, a lot of the flights that were supposed to arrive with international aid did not really get through. At some point, that airport was just full. And it was full at a time that some flights were still on their way. You know, it takes a while to get from Germany to Nepal. You know, it's not a two-hour flight. Um, so um, problems, airport closed, not open enough and these flights had to be redirected. Now, a very tragic example was from my own country. I'm, I'm Belgian, as I already mentioned. Um, they had a search and rescue team that they sent within 24 hours. That's sort of the idea. They have to leave very quickly. But by the time they were reaching uh, Nepal, Kathmandu, the airport was full. They were redirected to Delhi and India. That's sort of you know, the closest big airport nearby. Um, and then they had to wait, and to wait, and to wait. And three days later, they could get in. But guess, guess what? what? After then four or five days, not a lot of chance of finding survivors under the rubble. So they were actually quite useless at that time. Had to go back to Belgium without having done anything. Well, actually they tried, um, but then the truck on which they loaded their material broke down, so they didn't get anywhere. Uh, and they got a lot of bad press from um, you know, Belgian press, and they were criticized, and they were saying yeah, a lot of negative, uh, ex a very negative experience there. So, have a look at um, an airport after a disaster. Um, that, that, is, that is not uh, Kathmandu, that is actually... Any, anyone ever been there? Haiti, Port-au-Prince? No? You should do it, it's a beautiful country. Um, but that was the airport uh, after the big earthquake there, uh, the one that killed hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of people, 200,000. Um, and, and you can see a lot of activity in the airport. Again, it's not a huge airport. Um, Haiti is sort of the, sm the poorer part of the island. You know what the other side of the island is? You have ha Haiti, say, on the left, and on the right you have... Have you never been there on holidays? Dominican Republic, no one? That's the same island, right? So one is rich, full of tourists, that's the Dominican Republic. The other side is poor, not many tourists and that's Haiti, and that's where the earthquake struck. Um, so what you see here is a lot of activity. So, so what, what do you see there? Give, give me some, some thoughts here. What, what, what do you see? The Panama airport is basically overrun with people. Yeah. 
Exactly. So you see a lot of, somebody should have said planes. I see planes. So that's, that was a good point. But you also see, and that's, that's even better, you see a lot of people there. Um, what else do you see? Tents, for instance, yeah. 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 What kind of people do you think are living there? No, it's the responders who... I had the pleasure of living in such a tent near an airport somewhere in the Philippines for a, a week or so. And the first flights leave at 4 o'clock in the morning, that's a bit early. Um, so anyway, you see, you see a lot of activity there, you see here helicopters, you see, you see stuff, right? That is parked near. I'm, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. That is parked near the near near the runway or the parking space. So there is even more. So let me show you what what we have there. Um, the helicopter is actually from a search and rescue team. So they fly out to a place where they think there's a lot of you know people are in, in still trapped in their buildings. What you have here is the base camp, as you mentioned here, these tents. That's where the humanitarian aid workers stay because there's typically not an easier place nearby. You, 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 you just arrive, you go to your tent, and then you, you go from there. There's a coordination center here. You couldn't see that, of course, but that's where the humanitarian world coordinates. Oh, actually, I, that sort of reminds me that I have this beautiful pointer here. Um, if that works. Ooh. Does it work? Yes. Well, wait, let me go. That's complicated. No, wait. Ooh comes with age that doesn't go that easy anymore. Huh? That's like, uh, so here you have the coordination center and the base camp. There's more the humanitarian side of things. You have emergency telecom set up. I probably see it better without the thing. So, so here they, they have satellite dishes, they have antennas, that kind of thing. Um, these, this is a military operation here. Um, relief supplies come in through the, 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 the planes. You have these people indeed over there who are trying to leave. So you, you, you want to ship out people. You have some warehouses over there. Um, you have the customs. Don't forget, you know, every time you fly in aid, uh, that's not, that's not a, a ticket for free to enter the country. You know, everything you bring in has to be checked. And is it, is it legal stuff? You know, can, is it you know, taxes on it or something? So people still do that. You have immigration here. Um, a lot of the usual operations at an airport are still there. So you know what it is to go to an airport. You have to go to the queue. You have they check you. They whatever. So that is still there, and they 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 need to maintain that even for the people who come and help the humanitarians. Uh, but in addition, there are some some specific disaster response activities you know, like uh, the coordination center, the base camp, the search and rescue. Um, the United Nations has its own air service that's called UN Haas. They have special flights when nobody else flies to something, they usually do it, um, and so on. So you, you have these two things, the normal airport operations, plus the humanitarian stuff coming together. A lot of fun. So looking at this, you can, you can imagine that it's a huge challenge for a not-so-big airport, suffering from people who are not coming to work because they have other things to do, um, dealing with a massive inflow of all these humanitarian people nah, doesn't go too well usually. Oh, and don't forget another. Um, so, so I mentioned the, uh, the, 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 the 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 people who want to get out, the humanitarians coming in. But if it's really bad and it takes a bit longer, then you have all the VIPs coming in. You know, you know them, right? Uh, the the Ban Ki Moons or who is it these days? The, the UN Secretary General or um, the prime minister, or the minister, or a minister from here who wants to show how efficient the, the German hill, uh, you know, aid is over there. What do you do? You go there, right? And you, you're in front of the camera, CNN. You know? um, now, I can guarantee you, if such a VIP comes in, it's a complete disaster. You know, that's, that's, that's worse, because they have to secure the area, they have to... The best thing of all is, they have to find a hotel for these people, because these people are not sleeping in these tents. So in the Philippines, we were actually uh, dragged out of the tents because Ban Ki-moon at the time came. He needed the only hotel that was still standing, basically. So all the people who were in the hotel had to move into our tents, and we could find something else. Um, we found something nicer than a tent, actually. Um, but that, that's what happened. So, so a lot of things uh, are going on, and, and um, um, usually 
the, the first and only impression you get when you're there is like, oh my god, you know, how, how really difficult is this? Um, so with the Humtech lab, that's my lab at the uh, University of Delft, Delft University of Technology, we try to look at what technology solutions could we offer to a situation like this. And airports are one of our areas that we're looking at. We are looking also at uh, other domains related to humanitarian. We, we have people working on water and sanitation, for instance, in refugee camps, uh, where one of the big challenges is, you know, how do you make sure that there is decent sanitation, you know, toilets. Um, that, that's a whole specific domain. I will not entertain you too much with that. But um, the, 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 so, so one of the big problems is that that these toilets are, are often, you know, not, not too good. It's not like here or at home, right? Uh, and after a couple of weeks or months in such a refugee camp, you get we call it overflow. Um, you know what I mean, right? Um, so, but you have to clean it up. And um, one of the positions that is currently available, if you would be interested, is the fecal removal specialist. Sounds really good, no? So if you're interested, let me know. Um, big, big challenge. Um, anyway, so we're also focusing on these areas. We're focusing on, on um, now working a bit on the Ebola outbreak that's going on as well. Uh, you, know, you remember the big one a couple of years ago that Frank mentioned, where I was looking at the coordination of all the, the organizations uh, dealing with Ebola. Uh, but now it's a bit more complicated even, because the outbreak is still small. There's one going on now in DRC, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. But it's in an area of the country where there's a conflict. So it's close to the borders. It's, it's up, up north, actually. So um, because of the conflict, there are lots of militia and, and, and sort of rebels, they call themselves, uh, running around. And there's a very big security problem, which means that they can't get complete control on the Ebola outbreak as it is now. And we hope it doesn't get worse. It's sort of stable, but it's... So anyway, we're looking into that as well. But one of our, um, as I said, one of our focus areas is, is airports for sure. This was a meeting we had um, uh, last August in Montreal, where a lot of the UN agencies who are, have something to do with airports were present. And I almost didn't recognize my PhD student here. Uh, who is wearing a tie. I, I, I mean, that, that sort of surprised me completely, but he was there and uh, representing our work uh, at that meeting. So again, what is, uh, what is the challenge here? The airport is a sort of a hub uh, for a lot of things. It's connecting a couple of different domains that usually don't talk to each other too much. Um, so on the one side, uh, you have the regular aviation things happening at an airport, you know, planes and so on. Uh, and then you have all these humanitarian things arriving at the same time. So, so that makes it um, complicated. Huh? Aviation, you have, you have the, the, the normal things, but for, um, with the addition of the humanitarian operations, it means that your infrastructure that is typically already damaged is under severe stress. But you got that by now. So what we're looking at is, is here um, how, what, what sort of research is useful and interesting in this domain because there are so many challenges, so many um, things that you could look at. So in, in any case, it's a very complex system which, uh, with a lot of actors who have different priorities, different preferences, different needs. Uh, sometimes these, these actors are not even known. You would be surprised who you meet at an airport. I mean, that's probably true at every trip that you make. Uh, but even there, um, you don't only have the big UN agencies or the NGOs, but you also have like people like, not like you and me, but people who want to help. So they jump on the first plane to whatever happened, and they arrive at the airport and say, hey, I'm a volunteer. Fantastic, thank you. Um, but what do we do with you? Uh, so so you, very different actors over there. Um, we try to move beyond the anecdotal evidence. Because every humanitarian that you talk to or every person who has ever been at the airport in such a situation will tell you a lot of horror stories or war stories, you know. Um, but, but, but how can we move beyond this anecdotal evidence? What is structurally not working? You know, what is the bigger picture? So that's what we're trying to, uh, to, to develop, a bit of an, an integrated understanding of all these different elements. And, and then we look at current approaches, solutions, if there are any, and how can technology um, help with that? So, so that's a bit our, our uh, reason why we want to do that. 
And if we succeed, we want also to engage in maybe some training and capacity building. Um, because, and that will be the last part of my talk, we have a pretty much a good idea which airports are vulnerable. You know, what, what, you know, geographically, where are they, the ones that could be hit next time. So if we think about it now and, and, and come up with some new ideas, new solutions, we could maybe do that before the disaster strikes. That's always a good idea. So it's a systemic problem. It's complex with a lot of dependencies. It, it's hard to imagine even what, what all could break down or, I mean, well, maybe it depends a bit on your, on, on your nature. If you're a pessimist, you, you, you will think, oh God, it will all be ruined and destroyed. If you're an optimist, you hope that some things will work. But anyway, it's somewhere in between, usually. Uh, so what are the motivation and drivers for people working at the airport, people using the airport, um, all the stakeholders of an airport, um, lots of uncertainty. Um, in terms of what volume of traffic can you expect, or how much aid is coming in, when is it coming in, what planes are they flying in, what's in the planes. I could go on for a bit. Um, it's typically also very localized because every airport is different in a way. Uh, you have different circumstances. Is it an airport at sea level? Is it an airport in the mountains? Think Nepal. Um, I will show you an example of an airport that was close to the sea, what happened there. Um, is it, um, what are the exact numbers, you know, what, what, what are the figures, how much aid is coming in, how long does it stay at the, at the airport, how much time does it take to get it off and get it to the people, I will also come back to that, um, and how can we learn from all this mess. Great research topic, isn't it? So enough to do, I mean, if all of you would, would, would work on this full time from now on, we could maybe make some progress, but there would still be a lot to be done. Okay, enough for the generic uh, picture. So that's, that's sort of the overview of why this is sort of a fascinating research area. I will, I will now go through a number of um, research topics that we addressed last year with our students and hopefully um, see what, uh, what they did. At this point, any, any, any um, questions from anyone? Is, is it, I probably exaggerate a bit, is it clear? <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, no questions. Damn, I can't drink without. <laughs> At least I, yeah, when you ask a question, I could drink without anybody noticing. Okay, so far for planning. So one of the things that we looked at with uh, Walter Fail, he's an engineering policy analysis student, or was he's, he graduated last uh, August, is what 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 do we now mean with resilient airport? So we want an airport to be resilient. That means that that airport should, in principle, be ready to take on the incoming aid and resist or, or be resistant against the disaster affecting it. So what does that now mean? And if it's not resistant, uh, resilient at this point, what policy measures could we implement? So what measures could we implement to make it resilient huh? in, in the aftermath of a disaster? That was what he looked at. Um, He's a simulation guy, so he developed um, a nice simulation of all kinds of activities at the airport, and then he was running different scenarios with these simulations. So um, in, in my group, which is the policy analysis group, we do a lot of this stuff. We use agent-based modeling, we use, uh, we use um, discrete event modeling, we use system dynamics modeling. So um, is anyone familiar with, with, with each of these, any, any of these things? If, who has done agent-based modeling? Frank, I know you did. <laughs> um, the other ones, discrete event or um, thing is system dynamics? Mm -mm. There's a course suggestion here, Frank. <laughs> so I could tell, I tell you a lot of that, about that. The um, nice thing about agent-based modeling is that every thing that you, person that you see here is an agent, a software agent, uh, on which you can program, implement a certain behavior. So behavior could be that um, this person has to go through the check-in that you see here, then, you know, whatever. So you, you, can, you can sort of individually attach and define certain behavior that this agent can have or not have. Now, that's good for individual level, but if you put like hundreds of these agents together, you could start to see if you, you know, have a time sequence, you can see some behavior. And that's, for instance, interesting for evacuation studies. You know, how would such a group of people be evacuated from an airport? 
where would they go to? I think Frank, that's that's right in your in your area, right? Isn't it? You do this uh, this kind of studies, yeah. So um, that could happen. Um, we used this to see how much stress would be added to an airport by having a bunch of these agents running around there. So anyway, that's that's sort of the the, the level that we um, the thing that we look at. I already told you that there are lots of actors at an airport. So if you would look in detail, uh, what are the organizations? What are the people doing? What are their roles? Um, you have, for instance, cargo handlers. You have people at customs and immigration. You have a coordination cell. You have the air traffic control. So all these roles that people have play a role in, in, in an airport, you know, in the daily functioning of an airport. This is a bit of a, you know, even a very incomplete view with some of the humanitarian players in, in place. Um, Lima is the local emergency management uh, authority, I think. The OSOC is the on-site operations coordination center. Uh, we, we love these acronyms, you know. The, 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 it, and computer science has a lot of acronyms with humanitarian aid, at least the same number. Um, so first, the first job here was to try to get an overview of how these roles are related, what affects, who affects who, who needs to know who, uh, and so on. And for instance here, the gate controller is actually a very important uh, role there, because that person has to say to an incoming plane, you can go to gate this and that. You know, that's what you hear when you approach your landing uh, area uh, your, where you have to arrive. Um, normally the, the pilot says, we will land at gate there. You have no idea where that gate is, but I tell you anyway. Um, but that's important, because when the gates are full, everything, there's no more space, you will have to wait. You will have to fly in circles a bit, or you know what they do with planes, right? So, uh, understanding all this, we focused on three specific components of this whole complex airport system. We looked at the gate selection issue, so what gate should the plane dock at, how fast uh, is the aircraft unloaded? And then where are the, uh, what is going on in the warehouses? So it's unloaded from a plane, put into a warehouse. So how efficient is all that going? Um, there's again, and I will not bother you with too much of a detail here, uh, but there's again there's certain processes that are in place there. And the nice thing is with agent-based modeling, you can all program these processes so that the agent has to go through that. So it's a sort of a workflow, if you want. And that's, that's the workflow for these uh, things. Um, so for the three components, uh, the, the, the gate selection, the offloading, and then the warehouse management. And what we're really interested in is the resilience of the airport. And this is a typical resilience picture. I don't know if you, know, if you have seen this thing like that before. Can you imagine what, what, what it represents? So here, clearly, something happens. You know, it can be a disaster, it can be a major disruption, an electricity uh, blackout or whatever. And the performance of the infrastructure, in this case the airport, goes down very fast. <laughs> Something big happened. And then over time, as time goes on, you start restoring some of the capacity until hopefully you reach again a, the, the same level as before. If you're smart, you do even better, but hey, let's, let's be happy when we restore the operations as they should be. Um, the area in the triangle there, I could use my point a bit, um, that is a measure for your resilience. Uh, it's, it's a very crude measure, huh? but it means that the faster you go back, uh, the faster you can restore your operations, the smaller this area will be. Now, this is when something happens, your performance goes down. However, that's not the only thing. As I said, at the airport, something happens. But moreover, all these humanitarian things come in. So you have another triangle that you ha you, you, you're trying to, to, to sort of accommodate, which is the pressure from all the humanitarian aid coming in. So that's actually a second shock. You know, your first, you had your earthquake and you already are damaged. And then you get the good news. Hey, help is underway. Oh, great, fantastic. And then you get... Um, a, 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 a sort of a challenge over there. Um, so a lot of uh, things are happening. So what we're trying to do in terms of resilience is, so, is, is taking into account these two areas, from the shock and then from the aid coming in. 
Um, we define a couple of KPIs for that, is how much cargo do you process, how much of the cargo is idle, so it's at the airport but nothing happens, that's bad, you don't want that, um, and then what is the throughput time overall through the whole system, so from the, the airport, uh, the airplane docking at the gate to the warehouse, so the whole um, uh, workflow. Um, so we try to, 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 to measure that, and the way we do that is through our agents that we let run, uh, we, we sort of um, run, have different runs with all these agents under these different conditions, um, and, and we measure the uh, performance in these three indicators. Then you can do different things and test out different policies, that's what we want to do next. So um, as I said, a big challenge is often that people are not showing up, so maybe on your first flight in, you should not send tents or food or whatever, but you should send more people. People who know how to operate an airport. Because as soon as these are in, at least you have staff. You can, you can operate your airport. You could prioritize on different things, on aircraft size. It's usually better to have one big airplane than two or three smaller ones. You know, you have more stuff on one plane, one docking station, you know, one, one uh, place where they dock. You could also prioritize on cargo type. It helps if everything is nicely packed. You know, not like one item at a time, uh, but huge boxes that you can offload and that you can manage. So it's better and it's faster. Um, you can put in extra warehouses, extra holding areas. That's also areas where you can, you can store stuff. Um, or you can do all of the above. That's sort of the uh, most optimistic scenario. So we did that for these uh, different um, 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 possible scenarios uh, or policies. We checked how they evolved, and for instance, for the processed cargo um, KPI, um, this is the normal uh, operation at an airport, and at day six, something happens. And you could see that the performance typically goes down, but by bringing in something, it goes back up and, and is at a much higher level. Uh, the fluctuations you see there is, is just day and night, so we, we assume that people don't work at night, which maybe is not a, a completely adequate assumption in these, uh, these days of a post-disaster. But you see that you can, by doing the right thing, and it doesn't matter too much what it is here, you can, you can upgrade your airport to a very efficient, high-performing um, infrastructure. For the different policies that we have, we also looked at the outcomes overall. Um, so again, the three indicators for resilience, processed cargo, idle cargo, throughput time, and then also we looked at the implementation, and that's, that's the cost of things, or the time needed, so um, the effort or the time. And let me take you through a couple of examples, camera, I'm right back. Um, so no policy means, of course, that um, you don't do anything, you let it as it be, and you see that's a lot of red, so that's the bad situation. If you don't do anything, your airport will not function too well. However, it doesn't take any time and it's very cheap, right? So that's sort of um, the contrast. You can see for the other um, uh, options, for instance, extra people in, if you do that at day nine, so that's two, three days after disaster in this case, uh, it helps with processing cargo, even idle cargo is a bit better, and the throughput time definitely is, is good. However, that costs time and effort. So um, with all these different options, some are not helping and are you know, maybe even cheap or quickly done. Um, what worked the best overall was this combined policy here that we do all of the stuff that we think of, we do that right away. So we bring in extra people, we make sure that we only get big planes, we make sure that we have you know, well-structured cargo, we have extra warehouses, we have extra holding areas. However, costs money and costs time. Um, we gave these results and, and of course they are very crude and not very detailed and you know it was only a master thesis which was really good but still it was not a PhD and it was not an in-depth research um, project. But we present these results to some of the people who do this stuff and um, they were really interested and actually said, hey, that's a great idea to bring in extra people from the beginning. So um, maybe we have some uh, impact there. Um, 
We also looked at the fact that um, what happens when uh, a lot of people don't show up from 30%, um, uh, from zero to 30%, somewhere like that, and if the cargo is loose boxes, so individual packages or a big thing. And if you put extra people in, things go a lot smoother, as you can expect. Um, time is critical, uh, so the sooner you can do that, the better. I will move on because I am frightened that it's already 10 past five. I'm, I'm, I'm almost halfway. No, that's not true. Uh, I'm already fine. Uh, another project we did was on what is the role of an airport? It's to bring in the aid, of course, but you then have to get it to the people. You know, it's not much use if you bring in a lot of aid stuff and it all gets stuck uh, at the airport and doesn't reach the people. So what this guy did, uh, another student of ours, Vincent, he looked at um, reachability. So how easy is it or not to reach a certain place in a certain country from an airport? Let me take you. And, and, and that his system allowed people who have to think about these problems, so for instance the World Food Programme or other aid organizations, to have better situation awareness, to have better awareness of what is the situation now really, what is going on. So um, he looked at St. Martin, and that's the island. I, I said I would look at an airport at sea level. And that's actually this airport here, Juliana Airport. Juliana was the name of the queen of the Netherlands. This is still Dutch, not Dutch territory. It's an independent country in the kingdom of the Netherlands. We are a kingdom, a different... Anyway, so it's an island. Um, interestingly, um, half Dutch, half French always creates interesting communication. Uh, the Dutch, and hi, a disclaimer, uh, the Dutch don't speak French really well, and, and vice versa, the French also. So, so you can imagine that there's a lot of uh, interesting communication issues here. But anyway, here's the airport, and here's the seaport. And these are uh, typically in a disaster, the two main entry points for anything. Uh, it's either the airport or the seaport. Now, what happened with this beautiful island? We had um, Irma over it. Uh, that's about a year ago, and Irma really caused a lot of damage over the whole island. The French and the Dutch part, the same. So there was, uh, Irma didn't distinguish based on language, so that was uh, probably good. Um, I know I have to click a lot of times here, so let me try not to click too much. Yeah, damn it. Um, so the problem definition is, if something happens in an, on an island like this, where you know there's a lot of infrastructure damage, where roads may be damaged, where areas may not be accessible, um, where do you set up your emergency hospitals, field hospitals, your, your hubs for your goods, where do you put that? How do you get it on a truck, on the road, and how do you really evaluate the situation as it is? Is it blocked? Is it dangerous? Is it okay? And how much time does it cost? I like this visualization. And what this student did um, with a number of other people was looking at a computer model that could visualize that in an easy and convenient way. So what, I never know if there's now one more or not. No, see? Uh, what was he trying to do? Create a reachability model. So trying to understand how reachable an area is, so people who live in the area, um, and visual, visualizing that in a nice way. He wanted his model to be dynamic, so when new information comes in, like we don't know in the beginning what is damaged or not. So it is almost literally you have to go out and try. Can you get through or you can't you get through? You hope on a satellite imagery and there will be a guy from um, uh, DRL coming and, and explaining how this remote sensing works. But if it's clouded, and that's typically the case after hurricane um, passes over, um, then you don't see it. Right? So your only way is to go yourself or, or get in touch with people that can tell you what the situation is. So I want a dynamic model, uh, generalizable, just not only for St. Martin, but for any, any country, and uh, enabling better situation awareness. Yeah, I think that's it. So um, he wanted to look at travel time for roads, the length of the road, so, what, what, so he could calculate, you know, so the time it takes is the speed and the length, right, the distance. Uh, quality of the road, and what is the shortest route from an entry point to anywhere else in the network. Hmm. And then the travel time, and so on. So what he worked on was this. I will again try to not click too much here. I may, okay, I think we're here. 
So this is a typical abstract, of course, road network. You have an airport, there's different roads in there, you can get through the location in different ways. But there are, of course, a couple of critical points here. One critical point is this piece of road. If that is blocked or, you know, something happened to it, then it's impossible to, read, uh, to reach these, these areas here. This one is an important node itself uh, because you can go to this either directly or via another way. So we try to, for any, for the total road map of that island, we try to identify which were the critical junctions and which were the, the, the critical um, segments of the road. So in other words, we wanted to know which ones absolutely have to be in, intact, not damaged, in order to reach something, and is there an alternative if, if, if it's still blocked? And in some cases, there is none. And there's just one road, and the others are uh, still very messy. So let's see Hurricane Irma here. So it was probably the worst hurricane in a very long time in St. Martin. Category 5, that's like the bad boys or girls. It was a girl, actually. So, so bad girl. Um, winds of almost 300 kilometers an hour. Three billion dollars of losses. And, you know, for a tiny island like this, that's, that's quite substantial. And they are still recovering today. Um, the airport, for instance, was, was quite impacted. It was near the sea. A lot of sand was blown over it. The hallways were actually full of sand, um, damaging all the equipment there. The, the roofs were teared off. So today they're still operating from tents. Let that sink in, tents. What happens if the next bad boy comes along? Okay, tent will be gone, all right? So that's not a perfect solution. This was a situation report uh, with a damage assessment. The red dots show the damage. Now, in terms of the infrastructure, there is not much that is not a red dot. It's a lot of red dots there. I mean, a lot of things were damaged. We're not functioning anymore. So what did the student do? Um, are you familiar with OpenStreetMap and things like that? Anyone knows the name? It's like an open source um, Google Maps. I'm exaggerating. It's, it's sort of the open uh, source in the sense that a lot of people like you and me created the maps uh, by just uh, uh, mapping it out. Uh, it's available for everyone to use, upload, do things with it, have fun with it. Um, it's called OpenStreetMap. Check it out if you haven't done yet. The nice thing is it has also these areas where Google doesn't want to go uh, because it's not interesting for them, like in Africa, like in Southeast Asia. Um, you, you find literally the smallest village and town almost anywhere on the planet, you can find it there with detailed street maps. So anyway, you load in the street map of an entire country and then you, um, he, the student, calculated the distance from uh, airports and ports. This is the port, remember, this is the airport there. The greener, the easier to get to. Of course, closer to the airport, better. Further away, if you go to the north, a bit more difficult. <coughs> now, what th this was on September 6th, and on September 7th, the hurricane arrived. Then you have this picture. The port was severely damaged, couldn't do much. The airport was damaged as well, but you could still get around in the vicinity. But very soon, you ended up in areas that were very hard to reach, up to impossible in the red corners over there. What were the critical roads, junctions that were broken? You can see them here in color. As information came in over the next few days, we could update that map constantly. So we just had to reload and, and, and run the model. That took about an hour or so because it had lots of nodes. It's, 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 rather, well, it's not a big network. That's not even an average city in Germany, I think. Um, but you could easily update and um, reflect the damage uh, that was there. We showed this to people from the World Food Programme. They were like, we need this. <laughs> bring, it, bring it on. Give it to us today and we need it tomorrow. Um, because that gives them a really good idea on how they could deliver their aid. Uh, I don't know if you see the statistics here somewhere. The number of roads that were damaged here were 228. That was like an initial assessment. It was much worse than that. Anyway, um, so we, we sort of developed that model to identify critical roads, isolated communities, 
potential locations for shelters, you know, on one of these nodes, and prioritize um, the aid. So anyway, that sort of repeats it. I want to move on to the final thing that we did. Um, on a global scale, we are able to identify those airports which are both uh, critical and vulnerable. And unfortunately, the bad cases are where they are critical and very vulnerable. Critical means it's the only airport around. There's just one airport in the whole area. If that airport drops out, it's much more difficult to reach it. Critical means there's a high risk that if something happens, that airport will not function. So this student, that was Shannon, did um, a study on this, as I think I just explained. Um, part of the problem is that there's a lot of different uh, organizations involved in this with different assumptions, that there is not a comprehensive overview of all the data that you need. And as somebody said that you interviewed, um, an airport can become many things during disaster response, and I like that one. However, not many things can become an airport. So a lot of things can break down, but from all the parts and bits and pieces, it's difficult to sort of reconstruct an airport. So she looked at all the data that were available, and this is for criticality. Uh, she looked at the airport size, were there alternative airports nearby, nearby? Is it isolated? If it's on an island, it tends to be a bit isolated. Uh, is there challenging terrain? Is it difficult to land on that uh, airport? Um, and how um, is the situation in the country itself? Is there, is there political stability or not? And um, she consulted, uh, so she assigned different points for that. And the same here for vulnerability. She looked at um, what, what is you know, the, the, the vulnerability of the country as a whole. Um, what is the infrastructure vulnerability? What are the hazards? And so on. So, so she looked at a lot of different indicators. And the challenge was, of course, to find the relevant data from different databases. She, she, she used the CIA fact book. I don't know if you have ever seen that. So you should check it out. The CIA fact book on Germany is really interesting. Um, so they have a lot of information on countries uh, specifically. On Belgium, it's boring, so don't, don't even bother. Um, now, what does she, did she come up with in the end? With a map like this, uh, where every dot is an airport, um, small to medium airport. We don't look at the really small things. Um, with a sort of a color code for criticality and for vulnerability. Um, the, the, the redder, the, the more vulnerable and critical. Um, if you move over a dot here, you see what airport we're talking about. And you see a measure for, um, I thought it was a measure for yeah, the vulnerability here and uh, the risk class. So risk class is criticality. Um, the good news is, if you want to try it out, there's a link there. I will, this, the, the presentation is saved. So you can actually move your cursor over every dot and see what it is. Um, not much, not too many surprises, I think. Any idea where this is here? How's your geography? What country is that, more or less? You can. Yeah. Anybody? Afghanistan? Yeah, that's it. Uh, you were right. Um, apparently, Madagascar also has a couple of problems, but in, in for you know the others are not too um, surprising. Uh, you have Nepal over there. You have uh, some of the islands here that are critical. So um, why do we do this? Because it helps people to indicate or pinpoint what airports should be looked at. Because we know, based on this quick and dirty analysis with uh, criticality vulnerability, that these red airports, they may be very vulnerable and very critical. So if something happens, it will be difficult. Um, we didn't look into a lot of things that you could also look at, like cascading airports. If this one doesn't work, then maybe the next one works. Or if this one doesn't work, maybe the other one also doesn't work. We saw that after Hurricane, which one was it? Harvey, that went over the US. Houston, you remember? Houston was on the water. There's lots of airports in, in the area. You have, of course, Houston International Airport, but then you have a lot of smaller ones. But because Houston International was out because of the hurricane, 
Um, a lot of the smaller ones in the area were also affected and not working because there was overload, they were you know, sort of stressed out because of the big one falling out, so that also happens. Um, and a lot of things you could look at into agreements, contingency planning, and so on. All right, so all the co if you want to play yourself, I don't know, do you like to play with coding? You can go there, and we have the interactive dashboard on the slide. You can try it out. I'm at the end of the presentation, just summarizing here what we do. Um, th this is sort of the big picture where we look at training and capacity. So how do we, can we train and prepare airports? What are the different systems and processes in place? Um, how do we do planning and operations? And I mentioned things on prioritization today. I mentioned things on time criticality. I mentioned something on, on coordination. Um, there's a lot of cult, uh, contextual things that, that come into play, different cultures. I mean, German versus Indonesian is quite different, so how do you work with that? Um, different systems, legal aspects, types of disaster, and so on. So a lot of things that you can look at and that are very, on, it, on their own, are really nice topics to do research on. So uh, this is the current Humtech Lab team, um, and that's the work that we did. So again, I'm talking about it, but a lot of the work has been done by the people that you see in the picture uh, with me. That's it, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Bartle, for this uh, very inspiring talk, uh, showing us the problems with airports, but also some initial thoughts on solutions, how yep. to handle these problems. Um, I would like to open the floor now for discussion. So uh, if you're on the internet and watching this, you can type in your questions via the chat window. But of course, we can also take questions from here from the audience. I apologize to the Dutch, the French, the Whatever, <coughs> who do they offend in my talk, <laughs> potentially? <laughs> so are there any questions? Yeah. You need a microphone, so I'll. Yeah, thank you very much for your interesting uh, speech. Uh, I'd like to come up with an example that relates to your first part, uh, the, um, the search and rescue topic. Um, mm -hmm. I was working for a while with the InsaWorx Secretariat. For those who do not know, it's the okay. International Search and Rescue Advisory Group. Um, and they, they um, publish a book um, every now and then that is called the InsaWorx Guidelines, some kind of the Bible for the search and rescue community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're doing lots of standardization in terms of cargo, also customs, and so on. Yep. Um, and in this context, my question would be, uh, are they also reflecting on your research or on a more general scale? How is the connection between your research and the humanitarian community or the humanitarian yep. practitioners, are they really reflecting or implementing stuff that you are uh, finding out or yep. researching on? Yep. Uh, very good question. Yes, that, that's really the objective, is that we um, connect well and hopefully work together with the humanitarian organizations. I know INSERAC, for instance. Um, uh, I've been working with the, the, the Belgian search and rescue team, and they are, they are well connected there. We work a lot with UN OCHA, so that's the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Um, we work with the European uh, Civil Protection Mechanism, so the UCPT. Um, some people, and especially the, the guy on the left, is currently in Indonesia, um, looking at what happened after the tsunami there. So we try not to just do academic play with multi-agent systems, right? How, how sexy that may be for some of us. Um, but we also try to really uh, connect to the humanitarian world and, and, and present our findings, listen to what they have to say, uh, and also be in the field from time to time. As Frank said, in the beginning, um, I, I've been to a certain, after the, the disaster had happened, of course, I've been uh, at, at certain locations and places and disasters. And that's important because otherwise, as, as an academic, you, you can say a lot of things, but if you don't know the reality, it's usually not a good idea. Um, so, but of course, it, it could be better still. Um, it's difficult for an academic researcher to do really relevant and, and interesting work in the field because the needs are very practical and operational. You know, you need, you need to solve this. You need to dig out this. You need to remove um, yeah, some very specific <coughs> things. Um, so connecting research to that is sometimes a challenge. And 
you don't want to be the one that's standing in the way, right? So you can't run into the field and say, hi, I have to watch my camera here. Well, maybe do, I do that off camera. You say, hi, I'm a researcher and I have so many interesting things for you. Uh, you will just annoy the people. So they will just say, go away. We, we have to save lives and, and things like that. So it's, it's, it's a balance and you have to find that balance and build it. So. But yeah, so we hope and we work with a certain number of humanitarian organizations, also some NGOs, to make sure that the work that we do is actually potentially having an impact or at least is taken up. And, and sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Any other questions? Sylvia, was it, right? Yes. Right. Um, when you modeled the different policies and their implementation, um, how come you stress on the 9th, 10th, and 11th day? What, I mean, I imagine that's the days after impact, right? No, the, the, no, the first six days were normal operations, and the sixth day was when ah, something happened. Okay. Because otherwise it would be a bit late, right? Yeah, that's what you were thinking, I, I see. No, it was after the sixth day the disaster happened, and then we assumed from day three we have to get going again. That was an assumption, maybe we should uh, change that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah that, that was what we did. Maybe it was on one of your charts and I just didn't connect. I think I said it. Okay. You were not listening. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said it. I will replay my video tonight when I watch it from <laughs> in my hotel room. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but thanks for your question. I have a short question for the second part, the re uh, reachability. What kind of data your student collected to identify the block roads? Uh, from situation reports. So, of course, he looked at, um, uh, it was, was that Irma? Yeah, right, on St. Martin, right? Yeah. Um, that happened a year ago. He worked on it over the last year. And he got access to the situation reports okay. from the humanitarian organization. Okay. So he could update it with every report. Um, it was not live, so that. So I would like also to jump in with a question. Oh, so no. yes, <laughs> uh, so you showed this uh, global map about the vulnerable airport. So yeah. one of the key points I think you want to achieve is to get in touch with these airports, train them, and uh, somehow support them. Yeah. But uh, these are vulnerable airports, uh, and. It's, it's very, very difficult. They are overwhelmed with yeah. standard work. They don't have enough resources. Do you have any plans or visions how uh -huh. this could happen? <laughs> we, we will still have a beer tonight, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Um, we're working um, near... I, 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 I work in Delft, which is between Rotterdam and Amsterdam. You know Rotterdam and Amsterdam, more or less, right? Um, and near Rotterdam, there's a small airport, not too big. Uh, I think about, and I should, I should be careful, I say 20, 30 flights a day, so not, not huge uh, active. But they're interested in um, setting up a lab with us. It's called a living lab, because dead lab doesn't sound really well, right? So you call it living lab. Um, where we want to simulate some of these airports. And our vision, and, and maybe I'm, I'm just... It's just a crazy idea, because one, I, that's, that's one expression I really like from one of you, your German politicians, uh, I forgot who it was, but who said, somebody who has visions should see a doctor. Do you know who that is? Uh, I forget the name always, but I, was it? Schmidt, Helmut Schmidt. Helmut Schmidt. I really love that expression, because every time, I'm in a lot of meetings where people have visions. So, uh, um, but anyway, the vision that we have is that we would set up a uh, virtual reality environment where you could actually walk through one of these airports um, in virtual reality, of course, and you could identify where are the weak spots um, and, and what could go wrong, and you could actually simulate a disaster happening. Uh, so you could walk through your airport in virtual reality, and then something happens, something trembles, you know, or a hurricane passes over, and you could see the effect on, on uh, what's happening in the airport. Um, if any one of you would be interested in this crazy stuff, let me know. Happy to work with you or have you visit us. Uh, if all goes well, we start with that next year. Um, but that's the idea. Yeah. So then we would avoid um, going to such a poor airport and annoy them. Mm. Okay. But 
isn't there another problem? Because a lot of these critical um, airports are in countries where they don't want you to no. know too much things about uh, True. how True. their yeah, yeah. logistics are managed. Yeah. yeah, we start with the nice ones. But ah. yes, you're right, okay. you're right, <laughs> you're right. Um, well, uh, to give you an example, to illustrate the point here, um, Yemen, for instance, is now one of the biggest humanitarian crises. Um, there's a, a really, really um, disastrous, and I don't use that word too easily, um, situation there where um, a lot of people, millions of people are um, having uh, not enough food, so there's a hunger uh, epidemic there. And um, the airport and the port are blocked. So the aid can't go in. But yeah, you can imagine that they don't, they're not interested in us coming there. Um, we start with maybe some, we, we have good contacts with St. Martin yeah, because of the Dutch Kingdom thing. Um, so we try to really work with them and see how, uh, we can start with them with a couple of others that we know. Nepal is also some airport that we've done and studied a lot. So we, we'll start with these ones, but you're absolutely right. Some of the most critical ones in conflict um, are probably out of reach. Yeah. Okay, I hear that we also have some questions over the internet. Oh no, is my wife watching? <laughs> uh, I don't think so, I think the question is from Cologne. Okay. Would you say in general that you identify a need for further research in the area of post-disaster resilience? Oh. Yeah, I, I, thanks for your question Cologne. How's the, how are you doing? Um, yes, definitely, I think resilience is of course um, a broader topic than, than just disaster response. Um, but I think they are very closely connected. So um, I, I would even say I'm, I'm interested in when your resilience doesn't work. <laughs> so if you're just not resilient enough, something breaks down, happens, you can't cope with it, then I'm really interested in looking what goes on. Um, but I think resilience is the bigger picture and, and we're try, you're trying to avoid shocks in resilience and, 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 and disruptions. Um, so, yeah, in, in general terms, it's broader than just disaster response, but definitely, for, for me, it's, it can be part of it. If it really goes wrong, then you're into disaster response. Okay, this was the only question over the internet. Um, so my wife is not watching. <laughs> who knows, maybe she doesn't have questions. <laughs> Okay, um, if there are no more questions right now, I think we can close the session. We can still have some discussions here afterwards. Um, I would like to thank you all, also the audience in the, over the internet. And we will have another presentation in two weeks from Dr. Ulrich Rape from the Deutsche Luft- und Raumfahrtzentrum. He's Ulrich. talking about the tsunami early warning system and uh, other remote sensing possibilities of, of this institution. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and thank you very much, Bartle, for being here. Thank, thank you. you.